Hello everyone, Thersites the Historian here. Today we resume our exploration of G.P. Baker's Tiberius Caesar. Last time I promised I'd find out more about Baker, but unfortunately I've not been very successful at that. The only thing that I have discovered is that his entire period of writing only lasted for about eight years. He worked from the late 20s to the mid 30s and then ceased activity, although he would live until I believe 1953 or so. I'd really love to learn why he quit writing when he did. He had enjoyed an immense amount of success up to that point. His books were all well received, and then he just kind of up and quit. At any rate, today we're going to be looking at a section from his concluding chapter where he's mostly looking at Tiberius's impact as emperor and his fit into the larger whole of Roman history. But in sections five through seven of that concluding chapter, he made what can only be called a tangent in order to discuss the rise of Christianity. This is a fairly unusual digression for Baker, who tends to be rather well organized and systematic. I'm actually surprised that he didn't put this in the book at the chronologically appropriate moment, that is to say during the middle or so of Tiberius's reign, but instead waited until the conclusion and then went off on this tangent. And a lot of this has less to do with the life of Jesus than it does with why Christianity prevailed. He kind of fast forwards from Tiberius's time to the fall of the empire and the, I guess, path to the present. It is a big departure from his normal style, and I guess that's why this passage stuck out to me after I read the book a couple months back, and I wanted to revisit it now. Basically, Baker will present Christianity in a way that is the 180-degree antithesis of Edward Gibbon's presentation of the same subject. It's very clear that he's coming at this from a believer's perspective, and it's also clear just by the way that he organizes it that he is trying to respond to Gibbon on what amounts to a point-by-point -point basis. So if you're familiar with Edward Gibbon's thoughts on Christianity, then you can call this the response. Effectively, Baker argues that Christianity could only attract people who were not bound up in the social order already. That is, the people who were effectively the loose change of Roman society, people who did not have a firm fit in their community or in the empire as a whole. I think he could be on to something there, and that is an interesting way to look at it. I think today we tend to think of everyone as being integrated into society, but Baker's conception is more that if you don't have a, I guess, productive place, if you don't have a place that rewards you with material benefits and where you have an active role and some form of equality, then you don't really fit in. I think he might be onto something there, and that would be something worthy of further reflection. What he also, I think, gets right is that Rome became very rigid, especially in its later centuries. I think that's a fairly common thought. But what he does ignore in this account is that a lot of this rigidity, especially as it pertains to the time of Diocletian forward, this doesn't really come about as a spur to Christianity, something that Christians were able to react to, but rather Christianity was already rising the prominence when this set in, when Roman society became sort of proto-feudal in a way. So I think he's trying to make Christianity into a kind of response to that, but in reality the two kind of grew up together, and it's not at all clear that Christianity was a response to this, especially since one of the people most responsible for making Roman society more rigid was Constantine, the first emperor. Baker's belief in Christian doctrine and the superiority of Christianity also blinds him to the fact that the traditional Roman religion actually did manage, at various times in Roman history, to inspire Romans to great deeds. If we look at the Second Punic War, for instance, Romans were convinced that they had offended their gods, and they restored morale by burying a Vestal Virgin alive when it was found that she had engaged in some sexual activity. So, the Romans very much did believe in their religion. And I think that it is inaccurate and uncharitable to say that the Roman religion was uninspiring and that it was too rooted in the past 
and could never inspire people the way that a modern monotheistic universal religion could. The evidence suggests that actually these religions could inspire people and did. Um, they just happened to work a different way. But I don't think that means necessarily that they were less meaningful to the people who practiced them and believed in them at the time. Also, of course, it can't be less meaningful to someone who was unaware of an alternative. I mean, think about it. As for Baker's claim that Christianity represents and encompasses the entire legacy of the Near East and then transmits it to the West, that's a reach. Clearly, there are parts of the Near Eastern tradition that did not make it into the Older New Testament because those are the products of a small portion of Near Eastern society, and one that was on the periphery of it. It also strikes me that Baker was a bit anachronistic insofar as he presents the late antique and medieval church as being strictly religious and on the political sidelines. If we look at the way that history developed over the thousand or so years after the fall of Rome, we see that the church consistently tried to insert itself in the politics. And actually, they would continue to try for more than a thousand years. But it would usually fail. And ultimately, because of failure, the church decided to settle in and be a strictly religious as opposed to a political organization. But it was not for lack of trying. And I think that in many ways, Baker is sort of taking the separation of church and state idea from his own time and trying to impose it on the past where it doesn't actually fit. When Constantine really gets the church established, and he very much tries to use it as help for his regime. So I think it is anachronistic to try to say that there was any kind of separation early on. And in fact, Baker kind of acknowledges that in a separate point, but I think forgot about it by the time that he was trying to explain why Christianity was so impactful and transformative and all of that. All of this makes me curious about what he would say uh, in his book on Constantine, because he's got a book on Constantine, and I'm curious now what he has to say there, since he'll have much more time to, in space to lay out these ideas. In the end, although I disagree with Baker's analysis, he does present his case very well, and I'm very happy to share it with you. He writes with considerable panache, and I hope that I can do his passage justice. I'm also right now using a new mic. The old mic is still available, and I'm not sure which one is better because they're about the same qualitatively. So let me know what you think of this one. And also, many of you have requested that I do an outro on these videos. And for the first time, I'm going to do exactly that. So let me know what you think of that as well. Anyhow, without any further ado, let's get into Chapter 13 of G.P. Baker's Tiberius Caesar. Chapter 13, Section 5. The compromise between the Senate and the Empire, which was established by Nerva, gave the Roman world 84 years of peace and prosperity. It was broken up under Commodus, and thenceforward the contest was renewed on fresh ground. The real weakness of the senatorial party disclosed itself by degrees. While it represented the elements of civil and economic life, its members were unable to maintain the world in economic prosperity. They could not organize the production of wealth. Power was torn from them by fierce and hasty soldiers. The struggle terminated in the accession of the Illyrian emperors and the political reorganization of the state as an absolute monarchy, in which the Senate was practically abolished. But the military power could not maintain itself when the economic foundation was crumbling beneath its feet. The effort only hastened the end. There came a time when Roman armies were fighting the barbarians of the north upon no more than level terms. In Western Europe, the great military guild at last sank and vanished in the sloth of economic collapse. It was only in the last period of this struggle that the state resorted for help to the new religion, which was the expression of its unity and universality. The possible results which might have followed from the quick perception and early adoption of the principles of that religion are illustrated by the wonderful reformation and restoration which they brought about in the eastern provinces, where the empire was given another thousand years of useful life. To the west, they came too late. Men, not being entirely wise nor completely free, are able to see and to act only when the force of circumstances lends its driving power. 
History is the tale of the blindness and the blunders of mankind far more than, as Edward Gibbon thought, of its crimes and catastrophes. Christianity was the survivor of a struggle which included a number of competitors. The old Roman religion, the system we roughly indicate by the general term paganism, the old system of local cults and primitive customs, roughly and imperfectly universalized by a process of identifying the principal figures in its various mythologies and veneered over with Greek philosophy and literary tradition, this perished with the oligarchy, leaving only traces of its more elementary forms in the popular customs of the peasantry. It was, in its last days, no more than a literary tradition, passionately kept, like the love letters of a lost mistress, but as much a matter of past things and bygone glories. It belonged, in reality, to the days of the independent city-states. With their fall, it had ceased to have meaning. The Egyptian worships and some of the Asiatic cults had more vitality, but the worship of Isis remained too local in conception. Its external power of appeal was limited. Its inward philosophical structure was suited to a type of mind which fell behind, and dropped out of the battle when life became a desperate fight against odds. Mithraism, in some respects the closest competitor of Christianity, was the particular cult of the army. It largely perished when the army dissolved. Many of its adherents of the higher grades probably fell out on the field of battle during the numberless civil wars and frontier struggles of the last days. The power of Christianity rested, of course, upon its extraordinary Catholicity, it brought into integration a far greater number of elements than any of its competitors. It was a wine press into which went harvest of the most diverse intellectual effort, spiritual experience, and social tradition. The result was something which did not shield men from pain nor guard them from catastrophe, but braced them to action. Anything is possible to men if they will suffer and act. The theory that persecution makes men great is a very doubtful one. Persecution is frequently, perhaps usually, successful. The world is strewn with the dust of unprofitable martyrs. Persecution will wipe out anything except the truth. It was the element of truth, the element of life and vitality, that brought the early church, a mixed, often ragged, sometimes disreputable, occasionally magnificent army, struggling through to success. The battle it fought against its external competitors, it carried on also within its own ranks. The form it finally took was one which gathered together an alliance, the men, who were ready to suffer and prepared to fight. Section 6. The degree, as well as the nature, of the influence which could be exerted on the Roman state by the Christian Church, was profoundly affected by the structure of two bodies. There was but one source from which the organization of a Christian church could spring, the still unorganized, untapped residuum of population which had not yet been drawn into the circle of authorized Roman institutions. The reason why that church arose from the humble and the weak, not among the great men of the world, is accordingly clear enough. The social organization of the upper and middle classes could not be converted or twisted or in any way transformed to suit objects and ideals which it was never designed to fulfill. There was no means by which any man, or any minority of men, could effect such a transformation from within. The men who founded the organizations of Roman society had seen to that. They had so arranged its structure that it could only be destroyed, it could never be changed. Hence, when the time came for change, it could not change, and was therefore destroyed. This result was not to the benefit of anyone. It put back the progress of humanity, delayed its march, and costed an untold penalty in the destruction of life and wealth and the frustration of happiness. It did not save a single valuable interest. It did not subserve even the lowest ends, let alone the highest. There was no fresh organization ready to step into the shoes of the old, the old organization had taken care to have no rivals. Like an oriental monarch, it had removed all its natural successors. 
the church was not an organization adapted for the conduct of ordinary secular life. It was a religious institution alone. It could not take over the work of the landlords and bankers and merchants of the Roman world. It could do no more than nourish and inspire the labors of those who refounded civilization. The beginning and the, the subsequent growth of the church conform to the rules which govern the formation of all great social institutions. It began, as the rule is, with one man, and that man, as we should expect, had attributed to him a pedigree which classes him with the kings and aristocracies of the world. His first helpers and successors were, and here again the rules hold good, free men accustomed to liberty and to self-sufficing independence. The organization grew, and if it grew by this assimilation of men from the lower and unorganized section of the community, it was only because the other classes were already bound tight in the bonds of mutual association, so tight that to get free of them was almost an impossibility. Even so, there were recruits from those other classes, who either took the risk of discovery or anticipated it by boldly sacrificing their positions. And, pursuing those rules which govern such institutions, the church acted not by collecting the views of its servile recruits and striking an average of opinion and doctrine, but by submitting them to the training of a discipline determined by men of a very different stamp. The slave learned not alone to act, but also to think and to be on the model of that mighty man who was descended from the kings of Judah. This was something of a nature much more significant than could be shown by any of the class organizations of the Roman civilization. It went nearer to the roots of reality. All the class organizations of Rome were by comparison overburdened with mere custom, subject to mere drift, were out of control and victimized by their own incoherence and inchoateness. None of them could get free from the dreadful drag that is constituted by the necessity of conforming to an average of opinion. Section 7. It is worthwhile to remind ourselves of one particular aspect of the rise of Christianity. In the reign of Tiberius took place a process which constituted in the gathering together, in one brief set of principles, handy and convenient for propaganda, of the whole results of the social experience of the civilization of the ancient East a civilization older then than our own is now, and is grafting upon the civilization of the Mediterranean. Four thousand years and more of struggle, of success, of failure, of hope, of fear, of passionate aspiration and steady faith, culminating in one brilliant century as pregnant in its religious significance as the age of Pericles was in art, or the nineteenth century in scientific discovery, this human experience was brought into contact with the Roman world until its vitality began to run through the veins of that world and to change its nature. Rome had some 700 years of experience, most of it political and legal. Greece had perhaps four times as much, and its complete form was artistic and commercial, consummated in ideas of artistic expression and intellectual conception. But the East had a longer experience still and the form into which she threw it was religious. Now religious thought is much the most concentrated form of thinking possible to the human brain. It gives, as nothing else does, a set of values which can determine the relations of all other thoughts. What we need to appreciate, before all else, is the vastness of time, the immensity of the human experience, which went to form the set of values that entered the Western world under the name of the Christian faith. When it constructed around itself, as a means of expression, a ritual gathered from the familiar customs of mankind, a theology largely taken from Greek philosophy, and a canon law not free from the influence of Roman jurisprudence, it transformed all those things and gave them a coherence they had never before possessed by reorienting them according to one definite scale. Beside this, the ancient religion of Rome was a trifling thing, which could not hold the attention or the affection of men.